have the privilege of keeping you from tea, so I'll try to finish on time, uh, three sharp, so that we can all go for a break and for tea. So this is the strategy track, right? So basically, you had a discussion on API management, the API management strategy. John provided you with a lot of good information on event-driven architectures. And my topic is on basically shadow IT and how to overcome shadow IT or how to embrace shadow IT. Uh, before that, a bit of uh, background about myself. I'm the director of solutions architecture. I'm based out of Colombo, Sri Lanka. But I travel like every week or every two weeks. So, so I'm basically on the plane most of the time. Uh, I'm a big football plan fan. Uh, the Arsenal uh, FA Cup happened two days ago. We, we won the cup. Yeah. So if anyone's from London, anyone Arsenal fans here, go Gunners. So OK, uh, let's start off with uh, a quick storyline. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is the definition of shadow IT, uh, quite a short one. What shadow IT is, what shadow IT means, what are the examples. Uh, then go into why this concept is important, uh, why Gartner thinks it's important. Uh, then go into what we call empowered IT. Or, or embracing shadow IT, or, or uh, encompassing this, this concept. And, and then, of course, go into some reference architectures, some case studies, uh, some use cases about shadow IT and empowered IT. Um, Prakash was here uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Trimble, uh, so Prakash is uh, one of the CIOs of Trimble. Uh, so Trimble is a good example of how Trimble has basically used empowered IT to overcome the whole shadow IT problem. And, uh, and I'll be talking about that. And then Boeing is also a good example. At the last WZCon, there was a good keynote uh, discussion on, on Boeing's approach to shadow IT and how they've used a platform as a service. Right. OK, so what is shadow IT? So Gartner's definition is shadow IT refers to IT devices, software, services, anything which is outside the control of the corporate IT infrastructure or the corporate IT budget or corporate IT governance. So this means a lot of things. So, so Gartner happened to come up with this term uh, a couple of years ago, and then this has been a hype. CIOs have started looking at this. Uh, CIOs have recognized that this is an area that need, they need to focus on. And basically, a lot of the existing technologies have been brought in to try to address this problem. But in, in a sense, it is about what shadow IT is. And, and basically, so shadow IT is whatever technology an employee uses, which is not governed by central IT. So if I use a spreadsheet, if I, if I have an application, I download certain information, I process it in a spreadsheet, and I share the spreadsheet with another employee, that's, in essence, shadow IT. So, so some of the examples. Uh, so it, we, even within WSO2, we've got the various systems. We've got Conquer for financial information. Uh, we've got our own products for identity information. Uh, we eat our own dog food there. Uh, we, we have different kinds of systems there, but then we use something like Google, uh, Google Apps and, and Google Spreadsheets and our personal accounts when we want to share information. So we have a policy that we can only share information within the company, so we use the Google corporate account, but if we need to collaborate with a customer, we use a Google personal account. Right? So that's shadow IT. That's something that corporate IT or the DevOps team or the management team of WSO2 cannot actually overlook. Uh, you, you've got a lot of systems. So we've got customers. Customers need quick solutions. We've got our managed cloud solution where we can build stuff. But then we still turn around and look at something like Amazon. Uh, the customer would quickly provision a VM. We would build something for the customer. Uh, or we would quickly provision a VM. Personally, we would actually build a, a, a POC on that. So that's basically shadow IT. So all of these examples are around what the employees within a company can do outside corporate governance, and what they do to actually quickly build solutions, or quickly uh, and effectively provide uh, business with solutions there. Right? So why is shadow IT happening? The, the why bit. Right? So, so one of the major parts here is the consumerization, the mobility, the cloud enablement, so on and so forth. Right? So if you look at conventional IT, conventional IT dictates that you need to have these technologies, uh, these governance policies. If you need to create a VM, you need to come to us. We'll do it for you. If you need to uh, come up with a new application, we'll tell you what technologies that you need to use, so on and so forth. Right? But then you, you have the concept of shadow IT, where, where we basically decide that this is a technology that I like. For example, I've looked at Node.js. I think it's cool. I need to build a quick application so that 
my internal solutions architecture team can start using it, I do that. Uh, so, so we had a planning meeting last week, and following that, we decided that our team needs a quick dashboard. We didn't want to use what we, we basically had internally, so we just went to Google Sites and built something quickly, and we'd use that as dashboards. So that's not part of the overall company strategy, the overall company's IT concepts, but we, we built something, we built it fast, and that works. So, so there's a lot of examples, and the cloud enablement, the, the easy, easy access to cloud, the VMs, the Amazons and the rack spaces out there have also enabled uh, us to basically be able to create these technologies and solutions quite fast. Right? So basically it's time that CIOs start embracing it. CIOs or the, the CTOs of the world basically look at shadow IT as also a business enabler, as a way of quickly reaching customers, as a way of quickly providing solutions uh, where you have um, a lot of requirements, changing requirements, quicker delivery cycles, quicker release cycles, various DevOps policies. So, so you need an, a way to actually uh, embrace that. So in the past, the IT organization has been seen as a bureaucratic organization. Even today, you got concepts like microservices coming up, which is basically related to shadow IT, right? We're looking at the same concepts. So in the past, you go to the IT organization, you want a VM that takes three days. Uh, that needs to go through, uh, let's say, an IT head. It needs to go through a CIO's approval. You need to basically explain why you need it, and then you get it. And by that time, the boat has gone. Right? Uh, you, you need to change your password. That takes half a day. You, you basically need to create a user. That takes a day. So that's corporate IT for you. And, and that's for good reasons. Right? So corporate IT have their structure in place. They have their policies in place. They need to keep track of all the applications. They need to be accountable, and they need to be able to audit all of this which is why corporate IT was created in the first place. But today's business requirements are quite different, that you basically need to improve quite quickly and you need to provide solutions at a very high rate. Right? So look at a use case there. So, so basically, uh, so a business user comes and says, I need a quick solution. This is my set of problems. Uh, I only have like three weeks time to deliver this and I need to uh, come up with it quickly. The dev teams look at it and say, yes, yes, we can provide you a solution. We have this and this products. We have the WSO2 ESB. We can do something by configuring it. That's it. Right. We'll provide you a solution. But then where do I deploy it? Do I deploy it at the customer site? No. The customer wants a POC. They want us to show it. Uh, we can't go to our management or managed cloud team because they'd say we need a contract in place, and we have to create VMs based on that contract. Uh, but this is a big customer. This is a marquee customer. Do we have workarounds for that? No. So, so what we do then is basically just spin up uh, an Amazon VM, and we actually try to deploy it there. So in the normal process, uh, you then, then basically go to the CIO. The CIO would say, no, it's not compliant with the IT policies. You can't actually depl uh, deploy it. So the business user is ready to fund it as well, but the corporate IT is basically not ready to actually accept it because it's not approved, it's not tested, it's not QA'd, and it hasn't gone through the process. So then you go to the CFO, you go to the CEO, and it's a mess. Right. So that's a typical, typical workflow in many organizations, from technology organizations to non-technology organizations. So one of the other big issues is that shadow IT is uh, continuously increasing, exponentially increasing. Gartner says that 35% of enterprise IT applications would be shadow IT or outside the, uh, the corporate IT domain. So, so that means we need to look at this as a serious, serious source of revenue, a serious source of technological innovation, and embrace it. So we then go to the what part. So actually, what I've been talking about is why we need shadow IT, why shadow IT is there, right? Uh, so we'll now look at what the solution is, and we'll then look at how to implement the solution using the various WSO2 technologies. So shadow IT is not something that IT, corporate IT, and CIOs can just ignore. It will not just happen in, a, in an isolated manner and go away. The corporate IT still needs to keep track of exactly what's going on. They still need to be accountable. And in, in terms of developers, you build something in three weeks. You would then POC the application. The customer would like it. Now you'd have to deploy it. And corporate IT would turn around and say, no, this is not a technology that I approved. I can't do that. Right. So it's not something you can ignore. So you, you basically need the processes in place to actually uh, incorporate all of this technology innovation or this creativity that comes from 
developers. So what should a solution encompass? What should an empowered IT solution encompass? So the blocks in red is what it should encompass, and the blocks in blue is what it should really have, or what are the features, right? So if you, if you look at the red blocks, so it should be enterprise ready, right? It, it should be something that corporate IT owns, manages, and recognizes, but it should be something that is easy for developers to use or, or for the DevOps team to actually use. So it should be something that's agile and iterative, uh, something that I can quickly provision, something I can deploy quickly, test it out quickly, show it outside the organization's boundaries, so on and so forth. It should empower DevOps, right? So you need to ensure that DevOps is empowered. Uh, they are not tied down, so they should be able to use this to actually monitor the VMs, monitor the applications, but allow the actual users to create those VMs. And it should still, uh, in, it should still enable creativity and promote creativity. In terms of features, it should be API driven. So we, uh, we basically looked at the importance of APIs. So having all of the services exposed as APIs is basically very important to keep track, to be able to scale exponentially. It should be workflow driven, right? So you should be able to have an organizational IT workflow in place so that when, when you're gonna build an app, I would go through a workflow. I would create my templates. My templates would be approved within a day by, by let's say corporate IT. Uh, I would create my VM, the VM would go into a tracking system, I would then create my application. When I'm ready to push it, I would basically talk uh, to corporate IT again, and they'll just enable it. Uh, they don't have to create VMs and so on and so forth. It should, has, it should have heterogeneous runtimes. So let's say corporate IT is focusing on Java, but I'm building my application on top of Node.js. Right? So uh, a system or a platform that can support multiple runtimes, multiple environments, multiple tooling environments. It should be self-service, so I shouldn't go to corporate IT and ask them permission to build this. I should be able to just go somewhere, click it, if I have the right permissions, the authentic authorizations, and start building my application immediately. Agile programming model is quite important. We looked at that previously. Polyglot programming, so basically the ability to have multiple environments, multiple tooling, multiple technologies, so on and so forth. And then finally, looking at management aspects, so managing your applications. So that's, as, as John mentioned, we have the app manager for that, managing your app usage, so on and so forth, managing your APIs, managing your events, so on and so forth. Whoops, okay. All right, so a reference architecture. So coming again to the what part of it, a reference architecture, what I've come up with would look something like this. Uh, you'd have an infrastructure as a service layer at the bottom. Uh, again, a, and a public service like Amazon or your internal service with a virtualization layer, for example. You'd have a platform as a service layer. And then on top of the platform as a service layer, you'd have your various capabilities. You'd have the monitoring, the analytics bit. You'd have the security identity. Uh, open source is an important concept. I put that in there. Maybe it doesn't fit in there. It should come out as an outer box. But open source is an important concept. Bringing your own devices, so allowing users to bring their devices to work as well, and enabling those devices to join the enterprise. So in most organizations, you say you cannot bring your devices. If you do, it cannot join the enterprise. We, we basically, uh, it's a security loophole, so we're not going to uh, allow you to do that. But then that will not work anymore. Everyone have their own devices. They are not going to switch devices when they come into the organization. So bring your own devices or bring your own uh, so it's basically uh, bring your own devices, enables more, more security issues, but then if you have the right tools in place, the right framework in place, you can empower the employees, empower the developers, and let them use their own devices as well. API management, of course, we, we know the, the advantages of that. This, a store, a centralized store, where developers can go to publish their applications, publish their services, look for services, subscribe to them, so on and so forth, which facilitates reuse as well. And then finally, the management of apps. As cross-functional uh, capabilities, you need a tooling platform. You need to provide the ability for uh, the DevOps or dev developers to create applications rapidly uh, without them having to worry about setting up their tooling environments, their Eclipse environments, their IDEs, their ticketing systems, so on and so forth. Uh, workflows, again, is quite important. And then one at the bottom, which is application lifecycle management. So that's basically looking at the whole software development lifecycle and enabling developers uh, to easily create applications there. So the solution, 
from WSU's perspective, is, is a full SDLC, or application lifecycle management system via the App Factory. So what does the App Factory do? And we'll be looking at this, I think, in, few, uh, in uh, sessions coming up tomorrow as well. Uh, the App Factory is an application lifecycle management tool, or software development lifecycle management tool, which integrates to your existing environments within your company. So it basically allows you to integrate to, let's say, uh, if you use Eclipse or Code Envy for your tooling side, you do that. Uh, let me see this way. Yeah, there we go. Uh, if you use JIT or SVN or, or something else for version control, you integrate to that. You, you basically integrate to, let's say, Hudson and Jenkins, so on and so forth, uh, or Sona for, for your uh, testing part, as, and Maven, so on and so forth. So what the app ALM does is basically creates a framework for you to integrate back to your existing environments and gives you the ability to build applications and uh, get it through the software development lifecycle easily in a convenient and consistent way. So if I'm a developer, I would basically come to a central portal. I would self-service an application development lifecycle there. I would basically start building it using a cloud editor like Code Envy. I would then basically pass it through uh, a version control system, uh, a testing system, a debugging system, so on and so forth which would then still comply to organizational policies because I can build in certain policies, templates, uh, testing environments there, and then push it to, let's say, a staging environment, a QA environment, and finally, uh, after approval, to a production environment. So I would have all of these out of the box, but I'm still a, a developer sitting in a remote team, and I can do this in a self-service manner. So if I don't do this, if this is not available, what I would then do is go out, create my own VMs, have my own dev environments, have my own set of internal policies, build applications, push them, start testing them, then go to IT and say, this is my application, this is how I built it, uh, now help me push it to a production environment. Right? So the App Factory basically provides that full environment for you to carry out all of your ap application lifecycle management uh, tasks. So from a runtime perspective, it basically runs on the pli private platform as a service product. So we, we spoke, Sanjeev spoke about uh, Stratos in the morning. So the private pass is basically the enterprise version of Stratos or what sits on top of Stratos. So you got the runtime environment and then you got the WSO2 products as cartridges of Stratos. So, so that's basically the WSO2 private pass. As you can see, you have basically three different clouds here in this diagram. You have a development cloud where all of the development VMs would sit and development cartridges would sit. Once you're basically done with that, you would push that automatically to the testing cloud. So the QA team can basically test it and, and, and I can do my own testing. And then it'll finally go into a production cloud. Around this, you got an application store where all of the applications can be pushed. It can be subscribed to. You got tooling support at the bottom using a developer studio or code NV in the future you got managed APIs, and you got your managed app environment. Right? So again, it's a polyglot framework. So you have the support for various frameworks, as you, key, as you see, Spring, Struts, .NET, so on and so forth. You got support for the various cartridges. So let's say you, you want to manage the W sort of products, and you want to manage, let's say, something like JBoss or, or something else, like uh, the Apache mod proxy, so for example. Right? So, you, you have the ability to bring in various environments, various products as well, uh, including various languages, various databases, so on and so forth. So this, this cloud platform as a service basically provides you the ability to provision all of these as required, use them as required, manage them, monitor them, and then scale them as required. So again, the important aspect is it should be self-service. So, so you need a bunch of dashboards which allow you to create the application, so, so some example dashboards here, which allows you to have a template-driven approach. So let's say corporate IT comes up with a certain amount of templates. As users, we can also come up with, let's say, a PHP template that can be used by other uh, parts of the organization as well. And then when I want to create an application, I go in, to select a template which has certain set of APIs and workflows, and then start building on top of that. Lifecycle management, controlling, advertising, so on and so forth. So the WSO2 App Manager is a new product that we've released, as Sanjeeva mentioned in the morning as well, which allows you to track the apps, manage the apps, push apps, and manage apps uh, from a centralized point of view. So it's a central governance 
of all the apps you'd have within your organization. So again, they're basically managing the workflow of those apps, so uh, figuring out which apps are in production, which apps are in staging, looking at the usage of all these apps, because it's one of the important factors of corporate IT is to see which services and applications are used quite a lot and which have minimal usage, right? And based on that, make various decisions. So then let's look at a reference architecture. So that's a continuation of that reference architecture. So you got the WSO2 API manager, which provides you the functionality to expose APIs, also the functionality to have a store of all of your APIs. Uh, when you have the app manager, you also have an application store in there. You got an enterprise store, which can basically publish any kind of digital artifacts, from events to uh, applications to anything. Right? So, so that's also one of the areas. Uh, you got the uh, business activity monitor, which is now renamed as the data analytics server uh, for all of your monitoring and analytics capabilities. So that means you basically track uh, your services, the usage of your applications, your, your APIs as well as you, you track basically who is accessing them, uh, at what times they're accessing them, so on and so forth. So you can make actual decisions based on that. Uh, for, for workflows, you'd use something like a business process server, for example. The whole of this would then be built on top of the app factory, so which would provide you application lifecycle management with some of these tools. And as dev tools, as part of the app factory, you might have uh, Eclipse-based tools or, or some uh, cloud-based uh, tooling environment, so on and so forth. And all of that can be built on top of an infrastructure as a service or with a virtualization layer, which means you can spawn off VMs or you can sp spawn off uh, Docker images uh, which, uh, from the containerization talk today as well, uh, which would help you uh, manage this quite easily. Right. So. Uh, just before concluding, and my conclusion is that CIOs need to embrace shadow IT and, and basically empower your internal development organization so that they can come up with creative applications. A good example of this is uh, Trimble. So tr for Trimble, basically Trimble created a platform as a service which is called the TPaaS, the Trimble Pass, which enables divisions from across the organization to build applications on. So, so they've got a plat platform as a service uh, environment which sits on top of uh, Amazon. Uh, they've also got various cartridges like the ESB, the identity server, the work, uh, business process server, so on and so forth. What this allows you to do, uh, what this allows Trimble to do is to basically uh, have their various divisions. So let's say uh, Trimble Agriculture. So Trimble Agriculture can come in, create their workflows as a tenant on the ESB, uh, create services as an a uh, on the API manager, again, uh, of, of that agriculture tenant, and expose them to the rest of the Trimble organization or the rest of the Trimble divisions. So all of the divisions are created as tenants in the whole WSO2 stack and in a multi-tenanted environment, and they can basically create applications around this. Right? So, so instead, of enable, instead of basically allowing shadow IT to go, go on in an uncontrolled manner, Trimble took this approach, and uh, that was Prakash's uh, vision as well, to basically build this platform as a service and allow all of these divisions to build applications, services, uh, UIs, workflows, so on and so forth, in the same platform. And there could be a central Trimble global team which could then manage these, monitor these, uh, keep track of all of the applications, and push them to a production environment as and when required. Uh, Boeing, again, is another example of this. So Boeing also used the platform as a service to build uh, an, an entire framework. And Boeing also bring in their stakeholders as well into the environment so that the stakeholders can also use the internal Boeing APIs and build applications so that these applications can be used uh, by the Boeing customers. Right? So both of these are examples of how uh, shadow IT was embraced within the organization. And these are global organizations ge with geographically separated uh, departments and divisions. And basically, they, they enabled this at a global level, where, which, where then you had mu multiple divisions and multiple uh, departments building applications for the rest of the organizations, as well as for the uh, external customers. So there, there's been a lot of good stories from Trimble and Boeing. And there's a lot of other examples out there. But these are two key examples that uh, showcase how shadow IT was uh, embraced. 
So uh, that's basically the conclusion of my talk. Just so just to sum summarize, uh, shadow IT is anything that takes place outside corporate IT. Uh, so from a CIO's perspective, shadow IT is quite important to look at. Uh, so shadow IT happens for a reason, uh, and we shouldn't try to stifle that reason. Basically, you try to embrace it, and that's what empowered IT means. Uh, from WSO's perspective, we've got various products. We've got the platform, but more importantly, we've got an application lifecycle management solution called the App Factory. And we've got a private pass solution, which basically provides you the ability to uh, on the fly create VMs, Docker images, containerization, and basically so on and so forth. So in the future, microservices would take off as well. There's a lot of momentum around microservices again, which I consider an extension of uh, why Shadow IT was created in the first place. And again, wc 2 solution there is still the same. So it's the private pass, uh, which then enables you to build a microservices architecture. Right. So uh, the red light is blink blinking back there. So I uh, basically finished on time, I think. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you.